Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, shall live. And Jesus also said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And Jesus said, you know the way to where I am going. But Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so we gather here today with faith in Jesus Christ, who has opened paradise for us, not because of how good we've been, but because of how good God is. And Paul put his trust in Jesus Christ. And so even as we grieve missing him, as people of faith, we know that Paul is with his Lord and Savior. And so we celebrate even in the midst of our grief. And we also celebrate that the same God who is with Paul now, and Paul's in his immediate presence, is with us. And so in praise to Paul's Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I invite us, as best as we're able, to stand and sing the hymn, How Great Thou Art.
Let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, we praise you that you've made people to share life together and to reflect your glory in the world. Right now, we thank you especially for your beloved son, Paul, for all that we saw of your goodness and love in him, and for all that he means to each one of us. We thank you for the wonderful treasury of memories that are ours to keep, to hold on to, and to enjoy. The moments that were deep and special and personal, the times of laughter and fun, and for the ordinary days, and even for the hard times we weathered because they too were threads in the tapestry of our shared experience. Even as we mourn the loss of his presence here on earth with us, we rejoice and give thanks that Paul is with you in paradise. We are so grateful to you, our Abba Father, that we have the sure hope of resurrection in your son, Jesus Christ. It comforts us to know that we will see Paul again when we ourselves pass through the veil and are carried in the arms of the angels to your glorious presence where we will worship you together forever and ever. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our scripture today is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, in which the Apostle Paul reminds us to rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Invite Scott to come forward and share a tribute on behalf of your dad. One of the benefits and curses of time is overthinking what are you going to say? What are you going to say about the man who gave you life? Uh, most of you are just meeting me today for the first time. My dad and I didn't have the best of relationships over the years. And we had some major, okay, all right. <laughs> and uh, uh, on and off again relationship over the years, uh, strained at some times. And over the past year, I've lost a lot of weight. And I used to look like my mom's side of the family, the Johnson side, big round face and everything. And uh, earlier this year, I was, I don't, so I'm not a vain person, so I don't look at myself in the mirror a whole lot. And I've lost all this weight, and one day I walked into the bathroom, and I looked over at the mirror, and I'm like, you know, you, you've, you've seen the picture on the program, and that picture on that program is staring back at me in my own mirror. And I'm like, oh, where, why is my dad here? And I'm like, well, where did he come from? And uh, it's like, yeah, I am my dad's son. And, and, and it set me on this journey earlier this year of coming to terms with that. And uh, end of June, I started a job and uh, switched companies, same job, different companies, uh, totally on no, unnecessary reasons for that to tell, but part of the re what they do is they've got these core values in the company, and they gave us this list of words, and they said, come up with your top five core values that you think are fundamental and essential to your life as a person. And, you know, there's, you know, a hundred words or so to choose from, and these are my top five. First is integrity, second is honest, Third is loyal, fourth is humility, and fifth was tolerant. And we, we went through that, and later that day, and later that week, it suddenly hit me. Every single one of those words describes my father. 
every single one of those words that I hold dear in my life and fundamental to who I am as a person is because of Paul Edwin Householder, Jr., who got that from Paul Edwin Householder, Sr., too. But that, to me, those five words I looked at, that was my dad. My dad was, I never saw, heard my dad, uh, anybody ever say anything that my dad did anything wrong. Nothing wrong. He, he, he lived his life as, as in complete integrity. He was always honest. Jack can, can testify that he was loyal. Jack, Jack has known my dad for almost as long as I've been alive, and I'm 56 this year. So 50, at least 55 years, my dad and Jack were friends. My dad was loyal. Their, their, their original business partner died at the beginning of the business, and, and my, th they decided at the time, even though he had passed away, his name was going to be on that business for the rest of that business's life. So it was always, his, his, that original partner's name was always on that business name for the rest of those years. Uh, humility, my dad never, I never heard my dad brag. You know, uh, I always found it interesting with him too. I grew up in, in, a, in a school with rich kids. So, you know, fancy cars were the de rigueur of my fellow students. But my dad always just drove a plain car, you know. He, had, he made a, a really good living. But, you know, I remember one time going down and they'd, Dad and Connie had just gotten a new vehicle, and it was a Toyota. You know, it was a Toyota Highlander, I think. You know, nothing fancy. Uh, just this nice little SUV that fit the dog and them and their stuff, and off they went. And the, the tolerant part, sometimes, I think he was too tolerant with me, but that's for another day. <laughs> and... Uh, so that was my dad, uh, and, and I look at it, and I think, I look at my, the woman, the woman God brought me to marry embodies those principles too, and, and we've been able to pass that on to my kids, and the three of them, Amber, Hannah, and Jonathan, are a real testament to, in part of who their grandfather was, in, in integrity, and uh, listening to the words of the pastor earlier from my, and I, I thought about this the, you know what stories can I tell you that mean anything to you personally that can mean you know more than to me uh, Lisa and I were, were married living in Fort Wayne Indiana we had just had Amber I think Amber might have been a year old by then and uh, I had Lisa already had two daughters when I married her. So I had two stepdaughters, my own daughter, uh, happily married, totally in love with my wife. Had a job that I was good at, that I was being praised for doing, and completely unhappy. Totally unhappy. Times at work, I would just, this, this, I'd go to the bathroom just to get away from people, and this rage would build up in me. And, and I, and I talked to my wife. I said, I don't know what's going on. I don't understand what's going on. And then one day, my dad called me out of the blue. And uh, we hadn't talked in a long time. And he, he says, Scott, I, I want you to do something for me. And I said, OK, what? And he said, I want you to go to Promise Keepers with me. It's in July in Louisville. And I'm like, OK. Uh, I'll think about it and I'll get back with you. He said, okay. And, and I went away and uh, I have to reveal part of myself here. Uh, I'm Politically, I'm very liberal. And, and at the time, Promise Keepers was sort of the boogeyman <laughs> of everything I believed in. And uh, I didn't want to go anywhere near Promise Keepers. 
and I wrestled it with it for a while. And I finally got this advice from my mom of all places. Your dad asked you, go. And I said, really? It's that simple? And she's like, yeah, your dad asked you, go. So I called him back. I said, okay, I'll go. Where, you know, when do I need to meet you? Where do I meet you? And so we arranged it, went to Promise Keepers. First night there, gave my life to Jesus. And it's never been the same since. Uh, and all because Jesus moved, the Holy Spirit moved through the least expected place in my life, my father. And, and got to know what faith he had. Got to you know start this walk with Jesus with myself. Eventually, Lisa and I ended up going back to church. We had two more kids. All three of them grew up in church. Uh, all three have talked about in different situations what their, what their faith is, what they believe in Jesus. Sometimes my son, Jonathan, he's a lot like me. He doesn't talk too much to me like I didn't talk too much to my dad. <laughs> so I know he believes in it because I've heard from other people. But, and I think Jesus through my dad led not just my dad to faith, not just my stepmother to faith. Jesus through my dad gave me an eternal home. He gave my wife an eternal home. He gave my kids an eternal home. And for all that, I will always be grateful for my father. I will always be grateful for instilling that sense of integrity and honesty in me. And these past few months, get be, um, being able to say goodbye to him before he died, it just, it's given me more of appreciation for who my father was and, and the life he led and remind me how much, yes, I love my dad. There are times that I've truly missed him and I'm looking gratefully for the day when I get home and get to hug Jesus, and then hug my dad. <laughs> and I thank you.
on behalf of all of us at Venice Presbyterian Church, and there are a lot of us here today who have come to love Connie and Paul over these years you've been part of our church family. On behalf of us all, welcome to those of you, welcome to those of you especially who have traveled from places to be here. And Scott, thank you for your words of tribute and remembrance. And it just strikes me that in our context, we often get to have conversations with people about how we can share the hope that we have with our loved ones. And what a beautiful reminder that Paul, one of the most soft-spoken men many of us ever knew, the Holy Spirit found a way for him in his gentle way to be able to share the hope that he had. And what an impact. Praise God. So welcome to all of you who are here to be with Connie and with us today. Um, this niece, Amy, brother-in-law Don, welcome you guys. And again, Scott and Lisa. And a couple special folks here. Jack and Betty B. Temps. Uh, Scott mentioned their friendship, their business partnership, Jack and Paul, the consulting engineering firm they shared for 50 years. Also golfing partners and dear friends. In fact, Paul, who was an only child, considered Jack, considered you, Jack, to be like a brother, as you know. And I'll just let the rest of you know some interesting information that it was Jack's wife, Betty, who was Connie's head nurse and who introduced Connie and Paul. They met on a blind date in June 1981. And according to Connie, their first date was going to a baseball game. So pay attention to their love of sports because they shared that love. Several months after they met on that blind date, Connie was on a cruise sailing the Greek Isles when she received a telegram on the ship. It was from Paul asking Connie to marry him. The problem was Connie didn't know how to get back to Paul. <laughs> So as soon as she landed back on U.S. soil in Boston, she replied, yes, I'll marry you. And they got married on Saturday, January the 2nd, 1982. And they planned the date and time of their wedding around a Cincinnati Bengals football game. In fact, the day after you got married, the Cincinnati Bengals, I looked this up, they won their first ever playoff game. 26-21 over the Buffalo Bills at Riverfront Stadium, and Cincinnati went on to the Super Bowl that year. So what a special thing that on the weekend you got married, it began the beginning of a decade of Cincinnati Bengals. They never won the Super Bowl, but, but they, they had some great years. And how spe I thought about how special it was that the last Super Bowl Paul got to watch here on this earth. He was cheering on the Cincinnati Bengals. Again, they didn't win, but one day they will. Paul graduated Purdue in 1960, with a degree in mechanical engineering. He was a thoughtful, precise man, a meticulous engineer. And his engineering skills were helpful in building a log cabin home in the woods of northern Kentucky where Connie and Paul enjoyed many happy years there before moving to Florida. And Paul got to pick the house in Florida. And he loved his home in Lake of the Woods. Loved living in Florida. In fact, the last few years, even before COVID, Paul said all he wanted to do was one, stay in Florida, two, play golf, and three, walk his dog Heidi. Now, we know there were other things he loved, too, like coming to church and being with you, Connie. But 
the fact that he mentioned how much he loved walking his dog Heidi is so special. And you see on the front of your program that beautiful photo from last Christmas season. And I've always thought you can tell a lot about a person by how much they love and are loved by their dog. Because dogs, I think, just have an innate sense of sensing the grace and the kindness in humans. Paul loved Heidi. And I know Heidi had to be a comfort to him, even as some of his memory was being able to fade. He could just come home, he could go out walking with the dog, and how hard it was for Paul to say goodbye to Heidi. And um, Connie and I have talked, and she knows that I, I've done a lot of thinking and reflecting on the biblical promises. And um, I really do imagine, with, I believe, scriptural backing, that when Paul went home, Jesus was there to give him a hug, to welcome him. And I have to believe that Heidi was right there. All of us who knew Paul knew a true gentleman. I mean, you saw it when Paul and Connie would bring some wonderful, special ladies who weren't able to drive to church. And Paul would always open the door and hold it for all the ladies he was soft-spoken, mild-mannered, a beautiful smile. And the love that he shared with Connie was really a love between best friends. When I saw Paul in the hospital back in May, it was obviously evident Paul was very confused but he lit up when Connie walked into the room. And then as we prayed together, Paul just would grab my hand, and I could tell how much it meant to him, that faith that, that was deep within him. No, he didn't, he didn't wear it outwardly in, 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 in a demonstrative sense, but he wore it outwardly in just his character and the way he lived and the way he loved being here with God's people. And so when we were thinking about this service, Connie specifically asked if we could include Galatians 5, verse 22, where Paul writes about the fruit of the Spirit. He says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now let me repeat that list of nine qualities, which I think can be added to those virtues that you mentioned earlier, Scott. But think about how Paul, householder, if you knew him, every one of these values was so evident in him. Love. Joy. Peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I think when we hear those lists for ourselves, we probably all aspire there's something in there we could be better at. we shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that these are somehow natural tendencies that some people just happen to have more of than others. Because what Paul is teaching here is those qualities are far more than natural characteristics. He calls them fruit of the Holy Spirit. In other words, fruit, what is produced from the Holy Spirit 
that is within us. And the Bible teaches us that everyone who belongs to Jesus Christ has received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that, that is, is, is what enables us to overcome our natural tendencies, which are actually sinful tendencies, and transforms us from within to make us more like Jesus Christ himself. It's fruit that's produced in us by something, by someone greater than ourselves. And if I want to ask myself, how do I become a better person? Or if I'm in a place in my life where I'm just miserable, how do I get out of this? Well, there are ways we can try harder, yeah. The best way, the only way that we can become a beautiful person is to know the one who has the power to take away the sin. The one who forgives us. The one who transforms us more and more into the image of our Lord Jesus. And that's God himself through his Holy Spirit. And Paul walked with the Spirit. And the Spirit never left him. In fact, to the end of Paul's life, even with some cognitive decline, even with some physical decline near the end. He was still Paul reflecting that fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And when we see him again, he's going to be even more wonderful. Because the fact is, Paul was not perfect. None of us are perfect. But when we walk with the Spirit, the Spirit keeps making us more beautiful people step by step until one day we will be perfected in heaven. One of the great American preachers was Dwight L. Moody. And in his autobiography, which was published in 1900, he opened it with these words. A sobering reminder at the beginning of his autobiography that we all are going to die. But D.L. Moody wrote, Someday you will read in the papers that D.L. Moody is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. I have gone up, I shall have gone up higher. That is all. Out of this old clay tenement into a house that is immortal, a body that death cannot touch, that sin cannot taint, a body fashioned like unto his glorious body. That's our hope. And thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. So we grieve, but we don't grieve as those who have no hope. We've got hope. And it's through Jesus Christ. For the pastoral prayer I'd like to offer to close, I would like to offer this well-known prayer that was written by the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr. It's known as the Serenity Prayer. But I'm going to read the full prayer because not everybody knows the full Serenity Prayer. And I believe that these are words that embody the way that Paul 
lived faithfully. And may they give us hope as we pray them for how we can face each day, knowing there's a God who walks with us. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can. And wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time. Enjoying one moment at a time. Accepting hardship as the pathway to peace. Taking, as Jesus did, this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will. That I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. And Lord, thank you for the supreme happiness that Paul now enjoys. And give us, indeed, Lord, and especially to all who are grieving the void of Paul's absence. Grant us serenity and the ability to trust you and to know that you are always with us that you have the power to actually make us better. That you are a God of redemption and forgiveness who wants only the best for us. And Lord, with thanksgiving for Paul and with hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord we commit ourselves to you and ask you to lead us and guide us knowing the future will be good because you're in it And you're the Lord of time. And so in faith we pray together the words that Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able and let's sing the song, Because He Lives.
Lord God, we thank you for the hope that we have through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That because he lives, we can face tomorrow. And that even as fear tempts us and tries to drag us down, because he lives, all fear is gone. And so, dear God, trusting in that promise, we go in faith. We go in the hope, knowing that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with us now and always. Amen. As I lead the family out, we invite you to join us for a brief interment in the memorial garden, followed by a reception to continue the celebration of Paul's life. Thank you for being here. To God be the glory.